What's up? Welcome to the booth for the first time today with me, Riley Knight. And I can't believe my luck because I've got Mr. Paul Cheon alongside me as well. And I'll tell you what, we are champing at the bit to get down to the feature match area because it's time for round number four, which means standard is almost underway here at Pro Tour Ixalan. Let's not waste any more time. Let's head down to the floor right now and see how things shake up for round number four at PT Ixalan. Hello and welcome to live coverage of Pro Tour Ixalan Live coming at you out of Albuquerque, New Mexico. My name's Riley Knight. I'm joined by Paul Cheon. And Paul, we've got some real big names ready to get underway on our screens right now. Who are we looking at this round? Uh, looks like we have Yuki Matsumoto, who recently 3-0'd the feature pod that we were just taking a look, uh, making some controversial draft choices like taking Blightkeeper over contract killing. Uh, and, but, you know, it, it ended up getting him there. Yeah. So this guy, you know, turns out he, he maybe knows something that I don't. Against Hall of Famer Josh Erlene. Is yeah. no longer Hall of Fame elect. No, no. Because the ceremony was last night. That's right. The newly minted Hall of Famer. There he is right. on your screen. Josh Utterlate. And fresh off a top four finish at Worlds in Boston a few weeks ago, of course, Paul. And uh, I tell you what, for his opponent, Yuki Matsumoto, this guy obviously knows his way around Limited. He was one, has one of the highest, if not the highest, win percentage in draft at, at the Pro Tours, uh, but uh, not so good in constructed. About 57% his win percentage here, so definitely have to, gonna, uh, gonna be a test for him here. Oh, absolutely. It's a big test, too. You're playing against Josh Erlayton, one of the best players of all time. Josh Erlayton coming here with four color energy. We have, of course, the Teamer Energy Package, mm -hmm. splashing black for the Scarab God, but also, a little spice. Two copies of Vraska Relic Seeker. Yeah, we've also got. In his main time. We've seen players looking to go really big here with this with these energy lists here. Four color energy on the splash. Big black cards, obviously looking to take things home in the late game. But look, Yuki Matsumoto as well. We've got some premium cha draft chaff on the table there in Renegade <laughs> now. What's he playing here? He is playing. It looks like four color tokens. Four color uh, anointed procession. He's got four copies. Uh, I, I think kind of. This whole deck kind of functions around the card hidden stockpile, mm -hmm. which basically has a revolt trigger where if anything hits your graveyard, you get to make a 1-1 one, one token. And he has a lot of ways to put permanence into his graveyard. Um, very, very good way of grinding out decks. Yeah. Um, you know, if, if somebody, if you res ever resolve a turn to hidden stockpile, for example, against a blue-black control deck, that deck just has no chance to win. Yeah, it, it really puts you a long way ahead. But of course, the card that takes things completely over the top is Anointed Procession. This is going to double up any tokens that you get to put into play. It's, it's a four-cost do-nothing enchantment, but I tell you what, it does a whole lot when it's left unchecked. And of course, if you have if you have more than one copy of it, it doubles again. You don't get three, you get four, and then eight, yeah. and then 16. It's <laughs> insane. So it, is deck, yeah. it is uh, It does get out of hand. Mm. So Josh Erlin needs to kind of get the offense going as quickly as possible so that Yuki Matsumoto is forced to basically chump block every turn mm. because if Yuki does stabilize in the late game, he will be able to take over the game. But, you know, the, the creatures in the energy deck are very, very good at clocking the opponent. Look yeah. at this. He didn't even play a two-drop, but he has a Rogue Refiner and a Bristling Hydra on the battlefield, and he could be threatening a Glorybringer next turn. Now Matsumoto getting off to a good start with oh, both there's a of the enchantments that he needs. And what we're going to start seeing here is Matsumoto start to chain scries. And this usually happens in the upkeep. It's, it's unusual for a, you know, a, a black-white deck to be able to filter its draw steps so effectively, Paul. But that's exactly what Hidden Stockpile does. And now that he's got the Anointed Procession, he's up a servo every turn. Right. He... He gets to completely go off here, and now Yuki Matsumoto happy with the trade here, trading off the Rogue Refiner for the two tokens and chomping with the Bristling Hydra because he will get that hidden stockpile trigger, which will then double because the Anointed Procession is also on the battlefield. But Raptor also just wants to get creatures off the board as quickly as he can. Now, the, the obviously, the tricky thing about Hidden Stockpile is the, the trigger only takes place on your turn. So the, 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 the permanents have to leave. The Revolt trigger, it has to be uh, activated on your turn only. So if you're chumping that sort of stuff, you're not going to get rewarded with Hidden Stockpile. That's why we see upkeep scries, that sort of thing. But start to finish is a really good way to keep the tokens flowing. And we're going to see four warriors come down here, Paul. Wow, that is just a ton. And immediately you see a scry taking place. So that's going to trigger the hidden stockpile. And we really are seeing Matsumoto. <laughs> and look at that. Look, did you see that big hamburger of, uh, of tokens he had there? It's time to go to the skies. I think it's time to go to the skies because this is Raptor just falling mm. further and further behind the board here. Yeah, he's really going to have to put some uh, some pressure on it. As you say, going to the skies is the way to do that. I mean, Matsumoto has the ground locked up. So Glorybringer is going to be a good way for Adelaide to push through some damage here. 
And Joshua Layton actually only playing two copies of Glorybringer because he did opt to play black in his deck. So uh, unlikely for him to draw. Well, no, never mind. He has one. <laughs> and it comes. Here we go. And you still play two because you can still draw them, right? Yeah. You still have to play some. Keep oh, this, people honest. This card has been uh, cracking skulls up and down standard for a very long time, and that doesn't look like it's going to change here as these marquee cards of the energy deck come in. Chandra also getting it done here. But the thing about this, Matsumoto has a huge, huge way to just completely go over the top in the late game. We have stuff like Anointer Priest, cards like this that uh, really push things over the top in terms of gaining a, you know, a whole bunch of life, continuing to lock up the ground. So I'd, I'd still say Matsumoto's in a good spot. He's got his right. snoot ahead here, and uh, he's hoping to keep it that way. Yeah, he's down to eight life, but he has all the answers to that glory bringer. Mm. If you look at his hand, he does have a Fumigate. He has a cast out and an Ixalan's Binding. So he's got... <laughs> A a and I like this. He uses the Ixalan's Binding here so that he can't actually lose to further copies of Glorybringer. He could have also opted to uh, sacrifice a creature and use Finish to get rid of the Glorybringer. But again, he does not want... The only, the only way like, he sees himself losing this game is if Josh R. Layton just you know, plays basically a Glorybringer for the next two or three turns. That's he doesn't know Josh R. Layton's actual list, which only has two. Matsumoto did scry there. We saw the Revolt Trigger put two more of those servers into play. And this engine just keeps ticking over. The uh, the cogs and dials all nicely greased here for Matsumoto. But uh, his hand's pretty stacked as well. We've got uh, Vraska Relic Seeker in addition to that Fumigate you mentioned, which just all answers all day here. Right, right. And Matsumoto is down to six, and there is that Chandra on the board, which likely isn't going to be able to get another uptick given the number of tokens on the battlefield. But Josh Arlene drew another great card here. He drew Whirler Virtu Virtuoso, which does allow him to actually produce more flyers, which the black-white tokens deck does have kind of difficulty dealing with. Well, Virtuoso is a way to go wide oh, maybe, for the maybe energy didn't. decks, maybe but no, it, it, unfortunately it looks like Josh Adelaide. Oh, no, is no, no, it was a server of the conduit. He's okay. got the triple harness lightning draw against the token deck as well, and that is not where you want to be. Yeah, that, that's one of the first cards that are gonna get, that's going to get cyborged out in this matchup. Fatal Push taking care of the Servant, and this means that Chandra looks like she's going to bite the dust as well. Other Layden staring down at those uh, at Harness Lightnings, wishing they were anything else here. And a Scry again, keeping things going, uh, ticking over nicely for Matsumoto. Two more servos come down, and uh, he's really firing on all yeah, cylinders. When this deck gets going, when you draw both of the kind of the key enchantments mm. to the deck, it's really, really difficult to stop. There's not a lot of great main deck answers to those enchantments in the format. No, they don't have the same weakness that, in, that uh, artifacts do. Obviously, a braid is a bit of a, a pressure valve for any right. artifact-based synergy or, or strategies here, but uh, especially against blue-black, you know, the main control flavor of the format, they don't have main deck answers to enchant. Yeah, it's like nice spot removal. <laughs> I'm yeah. just going to make more tokens. Nice Thanks for playing. push, my friend. Right. You killed my 1-1. One -one. Here's seven <laughs> more. Matsumoto now. Are we going to see the Relic Seeker come down and do some hunting? We may indeed. Yes, indeed. Here she comes. Ooh, and Rasca. we get to double, get to make two pirate tokens yeah. here with Menace. Yeah. And this is, uh, and there's even further synergy, of course, with uh, with the downtick ability, with the destroy uh, a permanent ability, because you get two treasure tokens. <laughs> oh, mate, it's all upside. It's all upside with the Relic Seeker. This is one of the best homes for this card. All this synergy. Hasn't really seen a huge amount of play in top-level constructed pool. Right, right. It's where, What's funny is actually both of these players are playing uh, multiple copies of Rasca. Oh, yeah, that's true. Right there, yeah. But outside of that, in, in kind of what we've known to be the standard metagame, we haven't seen a whole lot of this card. I think one of the cards to watch this weekend, as energy decks t seem to go bigger, as tokens look to get a foothold in the format, Vraska Relic Seeker, I mean, the power level on this card is enormous. You know, we haven't seen a six-cost uh, six Planeswalker have an impact since the days of Elspeth, Sun's Champion, but uh, Vraska might be here to, to shake things up a bit. Right, also if this token deck becomes a bit more popular, Vraska is an answer mm. to enchantments. Oh, that's right, yeah, sure. And look at this, Harness Lightning on one of the uh, one <laughs> of the Venus so spellers. Bad. There. Yeah, it does feel bad. And Adelaide, and really with his back against the wall. I mean, on pure card quality, his deck looks fantastic. You know, he's playing against just utter chaff in Matsumoto's deck, but the synergy-driven uh, approach, topped off with something enormously powerful like uh, Vraska. I mean, you know, this this card, can, this this deck really plays ball. Yeah. Going to line up some Chumperinos here for Matsumoto. Josh doing the best that he can here, but. It's really hard. It's going to be really hard for him to fight through all of this, mm. especially because that Excelli's binding is currently on that Glorybringer. It's not. That's not even an out for him. He really needs to find World of Virtuoso as a way for him to actually try to push through some damage here. And this is the thing, you know. This is one of the one of the traditional weaknesses of the energy deck is they don't have ways to go face very very effectively once the board is locked up. Right. 
There's no burn, there's no reach. Glorybringer is often one of the best ways for them to do this. And Matsumoto's happy to sit here and just chip away at Josh Adelaide's uh, life total here like a lazy prospector. And as a result, I mean, he's really under the gun. Wow. And Fumigate's a nice way for him to buffer his life total. Yeah, he gets to gain a bunch of life here, make more tokens. And, he, and at the end of turn, he'll also just get a bunch more tokens as yep. well. So things looking very, very good for Yuki. Instant board, just add water. Here he is. Yeah. Now, Josh still has the opportunity here. He's got 12 energy. If he does draw a Whirler Virtuoso, he might be able to fight through, but it's looking very, very tough right now. Uh, Chandra off the top here for Utter Layton. The Hall of Famer fresh off a 3-0 start to his draft, so his, his weekend is certainly... Uh, Going pretty gangbusters at the moment. Look at that fresh piece of hardware on his uh, on his uh, finger there. <laughs> Paul, did you get a look at that's, that? That's a big ring. Oh, that is a <laughs> big ring. Obviously, the Hall of Fame selection committee did like it, so they put a ring on this fella, and well deserved it is. Martin User as well inducted last night, and uh, much of that uh, the coverage of that event can be found online. We can't let the Vraska ultimate. <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> Haven't seen one of them actually. As Chandra keeps things in check here, Matsumoto's just got to find a way to push through. Not a lot that'll get Adelaide back in this game, and uh, he's probably already thinking about what cards he can bring to bear in his sideboard. And he's going to have to dig pretty deep here. Attack from Matsumoto. Yeah, now that Yuki is currently sitting at 11 life after the Fumigate, he might not even go after the Chandra anymore and just try to kind of end the game as quickly as possible. No, and he's got ways to pressure that Chandra as well. You know, he can keep her off the ultimate by pinging her with a servo or right. what have you. No, I don't think he's too worried about it right now. Oh, well, okay. okay I'm he's just going to dish up a big bowl of my own words and chomp him down <laughs> because there is cast out. Yeah. Couple more servos, of course, thanks to that uh, hidden stockpile. And, you know, that's the real MVP here, Paul. Right. Yeah, and there's like seven creatures in play. He even had a chef at Dunes in play, yeah. which he could have used to kind of pump his team on the, on the following turn. So. Well, there you wow. go. That's all she wrote for game number one. Matsumoto taking things out very, very convincingly. You'd have to say these players are going to hit their sideboards and we'll check in with them for game number two. Stick around, everybody. On the other side of this, more action coming live from Albuquerque here at Pro Tour Ixalan. Don't go anywhere. We'll see you back here very soon. Play Standard to win special Standard Showdown prize boosters. Ixalan Standard Showdown events are hosted by local stores every day of the week except Friday. Find a location to play at magic.wizards.com slash standard showdown. The game I fell in love with, I want people to experience in many different possible ways. And one of the things that I, I want to see is it expressed itself in, in a, a modern sensibility, in the way that people are playing now. And that part of that is going digital. Like, I love tabletop and we'll continue to make a tabletop game, but we really want to bring out the best experience, the magic experience, the, the electrifying thing that made me fall in love with the game. We want to have people play that in a digital form.
And it's welcome back to the Feature Match area here at Pro Tour Ixalan Live, coming your way from Albuquerque, New Mexico. My name's Riley, I'm joined by Paul Cheon, and we are going to check in with one of our other feature matches while our main match gets settled for game number two. And I tell you what, Paul, we've <laughs> gone to the kitchen and just ripped the spice rack off the wall and it's gone flying everywhere. We've got a spicy little number here on this table. Yeah, so I would tell you that I'm familiar with these archetypes, but uh, not really. No, we have Mono Black Aggro going up against Teamer... Energy spells? Team of riddle form? Team, I don't know. Okay, yeah. So it's a teamer deck with the energy package and a tune with ether, long tusk cub, rogue refiner, uh, and, and harness lightning. But he's also got four copies of riddle form yeah. to go with opt and crash through. And and Enigma Drake as well. And you can Enigma Drake. Who needs World of Virtuoso no, when you have Enigma oh, Drake? No, Enigma, I mean. Enigma Drake's going to get in there for a bunch of years. <laughs> now, Nor um, Niels Norlander did take out game one. So the, the uh, momentum at the moment with the mono black aggro player. But we've got some spicy ones on this side of the table as well. Bone Picker? Bo Bone ba How about Night Market Lookout? Night Market Lookout getting up, <laughs> and up in the business. That's it. And we can see Ruin Raider as well. One of the cards from Ixalan doing, uh, you know, doing his best to keep uh, Niels' hand, hand nice and full. So this is one for the ages here. These, uh, these decks are really shaking things up as we see these players going now to game number three after it looks like to Mark Tobias had enough to take things over the top there. Hopefully we're going to get a chance to check in on these <laughs> players again because I want to see some of that spice, man. I want to see that little brewski that uh, these Well, one, one of those players are going to be 4-0 after this. Yeah, so that's maybe, right. Maybe we'll see them in the next round. I absolutely hope so, <laughs> dude, because, of course, you know, there is uh, definitely an opening for, you know, this this these new decks, these new strategies to come in and shake things up in standard here as we head back now and have a look at what's going on on our main table. Josh Atalayton and Yuki Matsumoto. We saw Matsumoto take things out in game number one rather convincingly, Paul. The uh, four-color tokens deck getting it done for Team Rock and Roll. He also, I should say, Team Final Last Samurai here. Certainly no more Samurais after that. Not just the final <laughs> Samurai, all the last one. The final last one. Right. Now, Josh Atalayton does have a lot of great sideboard options. Mm -hmm. Talk to um, me about them. He's got access to a couple of copies of Appetite for the Unnatural, okay. which deals with the enchantments. Mm. He, he also has access to Negate, That's which nice basically well. counters everything yeah. in Yuki's deck, right? There's mm -hmm. basic, you know, one, one of the things about not playing any creatures, well, you're very vulnerable to the card Negate. And Rap, uh, Joshua Layton does play three copies of that, along with uh, Spell Pierce. Now, Negate is a card that has to be on players' radars, Paul. It is one of the, mo if not the most played card in the format. If you believe it, only in the sideboards, the most played card in the format. It's not surprising. Not surprising. Very powerful. A very, very powerful card. And just an excellent sideboard card. And, you know, I've even seen some decks just look to play some number of that in the main deck as well. So, uh, yeah. And Josh has got to be feeling much better about this. I do see an appetite for the unnatural in his hand. Bit of a slower start for these two players here with uh, an early exchange fatal push against a rogue refiner here. And it's well virtuoso now for Adelaide and a card you identified, Paul, one that's critical in this matchup. Yeah, yeah. Evasion is very, very important in this format, this, uh, in this uh, matchup rather. The tokens deck just has a really good way of just kind of gumming up the ground, but it is a bit more vulnerable to flyers. Start of the start to finish here for Matsumoto, getting him on the board as well. But he, we haven't seen any of these enchantments. We haven't seen the hidden stockpile. We haven't seen the anointed procession. And I have to say, I've played a bunch of this deck online. I mean, it's embarrassing enough, obviously, when I'm piloting it. But it is super embarrassing when you don't have these the these, enchantments. The enchantments that you need. These <laughs> if you don't have the cards. enchantments, it looks like you just have a bad draft deck. That's right? it. It's not even a good draft deck, <laughs> mate. So we'll see what Matsumoto's working here, and you can see the Scarab got in his hand. One of the reasons that this is for color, traditionally Absam, sometimes Esper. Here, we're playing best of both worlds, and the Scarab God's going to get up and about. Yeah. Other blue card in Matsumoto's sideboard, of course, two copies of Hostage Taker here. How do you fancy with, wh what are your thoughts of this card against the energy strategies? Um, I think it's actually a pretty strong sideboard option because you would kind of mostly expect the energy decks to board out Harness Lightning and a Braid. Mm. So I think it's actually a pretty heads-up card to have in the sideboard if you just kind of assume that the energy decks are going to board those out. So then the only removal effects that they could use would be Chandra if they kept it in, which might not even necessarily be great against no. kind of the go-away token strategy and Glorybringer. So it, it might be a pretty good card to bring in. He's also got a few copies of the rest in his sideboard, which kind of works well with the Hostage Taker because it allows you to kind of protect the Hostage Taker. Clear the way now. And we're going to see the Scarab God come down after a big block from Matsumoto there, taking care of that World of Virtuoso. So does Matsumoto have the answer to the uh, the Scarab God? We can see now a cast out taking care of the God. Right. But he definitely does. Paul, a card that I really like against the Scarab God is Ixalan's Binding. Yeah, it's just, it, it's, it's a way to kind of, 
make make sure you can't lose to kind of the inevitable effects that you have. Whoa. Okay. Whoa, well, wait, wait, wait. <laughs> well, well, let's just <laughs> let's table that discussion and, and for a short amount thing. of time. Most energy decks Jeez. don't play Vraska. When you play cards like Cast Out and Ixali's Binding, you think, well, it's safe. It's safe. Mm. There's just not going to have anything. Yeah. But yeah. Team Channel Fireball playing Vraska in their four-color energy deck. One of, the th one of the other things that's important to note about the tokens deck is that they try to overload enchantment and removal. I mean, you can't have a squillion billion copies of Appetite for the Unnatural. Right. You're overloading their the, what they have in terms of targets. Frasca, as a repeatable way to remove enchantments, absolutely wrecks the token yeah. decks, even after they're set up. Yeah, the, th the thing with Appetite for the Unnatural is if your opponents don't have any enchantments in play, it's a pretty embarrassing card mm. to have in your hand. But Frasca's always good. Yeah. The moment you play it on turn six, you're always going to have some good application for the card. So... Yeah, it's one of the keys to this matchup. This is a huge play here for Adelaide, and he's really, really going to be happy with the position he's in now. Of course, that Scarab God tidily answered by the cast out, but Vraska has come down and essentially provided a huge bonus here for the Hall of Famer because, of course, the Scarab God came back down after that cast out was removed. Vraska down to two after the, uh, the attack from our good friend, the Warrior Token now. Scarab God back in Adelaide's hand, and it's up to him, but, I mean, he can apply as much pressure as he wants here. Yuki going for kind of the tempo play there, knowing that Josh Adelaide will very unlikely forget mm. to return that Scarab God back to his hand. But I, th I believe he might have his own Scarab God, so maybe he just wants to tie up Josh Adelaide's mana. And have these two banjos duel against each other. Fumigate also in the hand of Matsumoto here. Another way for him to keep the board nice and clear. An odd thing that you would think in a tokens deck, playing a Wrath, but it can be hugely effective, especially when you're gaining, you know, 20, 30, 40 billion life when the board is nice and full. Yeah, also just with the combination of it in Stockpile and mm. or, uh, Anointed Procession when you have both of those in play, you don't mind losing a couple of your tokens when you're clearing out just giant bristling hydras on the other side of the board. Yeah, and you get those tokens right back uh, straight again once the uh, dust has settled on your Wrath effect here. But I have to say, Adelaide's in a great position now, putting a lot of pressure on Matsumoto as we see uh, Vraska come down. Oh, sorry, go up. Upstairs for her now. And Yuki just currently doesn't have a great answer to the Vraska. He's going to need to find another copy of his either uh, Cast Out or the Exali's Binding. Looks like start to finish in the hand of the Japanese player here. In addition to that Fumigate and the Scarab God we talked about before, he is able to cast all of those cards. But none of them in a great position, you have to say. Maybe the Scarab God is where he wants to head off? Where, where is he setting his sail here? Yeah, I mean, you, you, you're you in kind of a weird situation there, right? Because Josh Arlene is the kind of the, the person that has the board advantage. And generally, the, you know, the person with the board advantage can just pass with the Scarab God and mana up. So you're kind of in an awkward spot because you're kind of behind and you have the Scarab God on the board. Now, Josh Arlene could also use the Vraska to just force Yuki Matsumoto to replay it, giving him that, that big tempo swing as well. So, start to finish, first half of it. And we're going to see, are we going to see again? Yeah, oh, yeah look I at think, this. Yep. He just wants it off the board. He doesn't yep. want to let Adelaide untap with the, with the Scarab God here. Josh is very likely to block one of the tokens here, get that Vigilance creature off the board, and Braska would go down to three here. Matsumoto, I mean, he, you know, he's treading water, but slowly but surely, his, uh, his, his snoot's going to go under the water here because... He's not in a great spot. I mean, he's an anointed like, procession. Man, he didn't forget again. <laughs> that, that's kind <laughs> of how like unlucky. He's, he's like, so unlucky. This, this Hall of Famer, may, maybe he'll forget this time. Just, just come on, come on, Josh. Give me a break here. You have a Vraska on the board. Be nice. Yeah, taking a look at Josh's hand, he's got two copies yeah, of stacked. Appetite for the Unnatural. So stacked here. It's gonna be so difficult for Yuki to come yes. to come out of this. He's got more answers here than a cheat sheet. He's ready to go for it. In addition to, look at this, double appetite, double scarab god, Nissa, Is world of virtuoso. Nissa? Stu, I didn't, I, okay. If there was, I, th this not, wouldn't have even been in my top 30 list of cards I'd expect to see in this tournament. Nissa, steward of elements, wow. And brought in in this position as well. I mean, planeswalkers are, you know, not at the be their best against go wide strategies unless you can protect them by going wide yourself. But, I mean, the steward of elements might be here to do some work. Yeah, I guess taking a look at Josh Erlene's deck, he is playing, you know, seven spot removal spells in his main deck, so he has he needs to bring in some cards. Well, but, uh, yeah. Matsumoto had a look <laughs> up on the wall, saw the writing on it, and scooped up his cards. Utter late. And I mean, we talked about the dominance that Matsumoto had in game number one there. Absolutely flipped the script here for game number two. The Hall of Famer never looking to be in any trouble. I mean, that cast out, I guess, was, I guess, was sort of the shatter point for that game. If we'd seen things pan out differently, if we didn't have the Vraska from Adelaide at that point, maybe that things could have broken, you know, a, a different way here. But uh, as it was, I mean, Matsumoto never in that game, really. Yeah. We're going to have a check-in now with our one of our backup tables here. Let's go over to our second table and see what is up between Michael Marici and Shao Han here. Look at this. It's the APAC All-Stars now. 
Marici out of Australia and, of course, Xiao Han from China. These two going at it here. And it looks like, of course, Team Energy making an appearance in the feature match area once again in the hands of Xiao Han. But uh, Michael Marici, he's on a, he's on an interesting deck here, Paul. Yeah, he's, he's playing Mono White, Oketra's Monument. Mm. Now, this was a deck that kind of rose in popularity a bit kind of towards right before um, Ixalan came out. Mm -hmm. There was monument decks all over the place. But then kind of the existence of a braid and a, you know, just basically four, four copies of a braid and all these yeah. kind of decks kind of um, shifted this deck out of the metagame. But, you know, maybe with less of braids being played now, it's an okay deck to play. But it, it, it does look pretty awesome. I mean, he's playing, you know, just basically all the good, good aggressive white cards. Yeah, he's got the Vanguard. monument and yep. you can monument out into the Angel of Invention. He's got a couple of Trial of Solidarities as well. And no, no cartouches. Just no. Trial of Solidarity as a way to pump your team. Yeah, getcha. Getcha, he says. And we've got interesting ones as well. Cards we haven't seen since we were drafting Kaladesh Block. We've got stuff like Thopter Arrest and uh, other goodies like that here. In addition to things like Cast Out, you see the Thopter Arrest on your screen there, down the bottom left-hand corner of the Australian's board here. Yeah, but you see the just kind of the Team or Energy deck doing its thing, right? Mm. Just... Very good at gumming up the ground. And taking the fight to the skies here. And Marici not in a hugely uh, great position uh, to combat that strategy here. I mean, you know, he can go to the air with things like Angel of Invention. But uh, when you're playing a Legion Conquistador deck, Paul, he's got the full four copies, by the way. I did not even see that. Le Legion Conquistador Legion down the bottom? Conquistador. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Of course, of course. Yeah. Great with the monument, of course. Yeah, <laughs> not so great without it, but still, <laughs> so fills great. up your hand. When you, when, you, when you kind of look at the other three three mana creatures you could be playing in this yeah. format. One of which, of course, is Kinjali Sunwing here. Michael Marici obviously looking to stay nice and aggressive, keep those blockers tapped down while he's on the front foot here. But Shaohan's making life very, very difficult for Marici here. Also an excellent cyborg card against the Raminep Red deck, as most of their creatures have mm. faced. Oh, yeah, sure. Yeah, absolutely. It can really take the teeth out of something like an Arncrop Crasher, of course. Of course, Hazaret. <laughs> right. Marici, in he comes, swinging the willow around. Down to Vanguard, very good on offense. Oh, yeah. Not so much on defense. <laughs> Not so much <laughs> on defense, no, for sure. We're going to see a block here. But the, So now, now what's Michael going to do? Is he going to... Pay eight life to keep, keep both of his vanguards around. That seems to put him in a really tough spot, given that there's going to be kind of the uh, the lethal thopter. So yeah, he just opts for the trade here. No, he's just going to do the old tame impala and let it happen here. And now it's glory bound initiate. Another another one of these cards, Paul, that is just bonkers when you've got a monument. Not so good without it. Yeah. I mean, it's. I mean, look, it's still a beater and it can gain you some life, do whatever else. But you know. This deck, in the same way that Anointed Procession, Hidden Stockpile, Push the Tokens deck over the over the top, this deck really needs the monument out to shine. Right, right. Yeah. Th these are decks that are kind of built around a specific artifact or enchantment. Mm. If you don't have it, when you kind of compare its power level to a lot of these cards with just generically good, these decks with generically good cards, it's just going to fall short. So Xiao Han here, going through the motions. He's got a tune with Aether. He's going to keep the energy flowing. Marici reduced to what I think is a, a single copy of Dusk to Dawn in his hand. I think it's the only split cut in his list, so that's a safe bet there. That's not a bad card when you're playing all these little white weenies. Yeah, yeah, he's... That's why he's happy to kind of trade off his creatures here where he can so he can get those creatures back. And usually Dusk to Dawn really shines against Tima. Really, you know, can clear out the, the Hydras, the Dragons of the World, but look at, <laughs> look at this. <laughs> not against World of Rich oh, World. That, that, that's, that's so the good. thing about this deck. It's just like, okay, there's all these big creatures and maybe I have an answer for them, but then... Whenever you're like, you know, looking to play this aggressive deck, it's like, well, you know, how do I deal with this world of virtuoso? Glory well, the answer is you can't. Glory bring is going to come down now. Big attacks in the air for Shao Han, Look, putting a lot of pressure on Marici now. Swing with everything. Swing with the team. Right click, attack with all. And what can Marici do here? Dusk to dawn. We're going to see a pretty little chump lock from the metallic mimic. Another card that we haven't seen a lot of since the zombie days of your Paul. And Marici takes an absolute pasting here. Checks in with the top of his library. What can he find? What's going to get him <laughs> out of this position? Not a trial Paul? of solidarity, I'll tell you that much. Oh, dear. Oh, Not dearie me. Well, unfortunately for Marici, he's gone down to Zhao Han. But uh, Timor, still one of the top dogs of standard. Unsurprising to see it do very well against the Australian here. So he's going to have to dig deep as his quest for glory continues. But Zhao Han, congratulations to him as he defends a very, very strong start here at Pro Tour Ixalan. Things still shuffling up on our main table by the look of things. Some mulligan, oh sorry, some uh, sideboarding still going on between these two. So as soon as those players are ready to go, we'll check in with them here.
Looks like things are off to the races now. A tune with Ether kicking things off for uh, Utter Layton. Matsumoto getting off to a good start with Legion's Landing. Yep. Only, Legion's two, only two copies in his deck. Yeah, which I find very interesting. I mean, this card is a great starter. But, you know, if you can curve something like a Legion's Landing into a hidden stockpile, into an evolving wild, something like that, you can really get things going. Obviously, Anointed Procession is going to put you over the top. But uh, obviously, the other side of the card is really where you want to be. You've got a, a Procession or two out and, a, you know, an old uh, the old... Uh, Adanto the first fort. Whew, you've got a yeah, few it, it seems like one of those cards that, like, once you get it flipped with all of your token payoff cards, it's incredibly powerful. But it does also seem pretty hard to flip it early because you don't mm. really have a ton of creatures in no, your deck. No, that's true. That's true. It's more, much more of a late game card, a late game engine, which uh, Matsumoto's <laughs> deck is certainly full of here. Josh is really thinking, what? Okay, we just played limited. This is not a Skullduggery, <laughs> right? This <laughs> is not a Skullduggery. Very Am I going to get Skullduggery to here? No, we can't. Round four of the Pro Tour. So we can <laughs> see what's happening here. Matsumoto obviously happy to attack with the Vampire because it's going to be slightly downgraded into a, uh, a servo token now with that hidden stockpile here. And following things up with a start, playing that in his main phase, Paul. Yeah. Uh, he is playing around the card Negate. He's probably mindful of the fact that Josh Arlene could have that, so he's just deciding to just play that in his main phase. That's about up to 22 after that vampire is poked in once or twice. And he really does want to have three creatures on the board yeah. because he has a Legion's Landing. So it's really important that he gets us on the board because it does, this does put pr pressure on Josh. It's like, now if you have a removal effect, you need to use it on one of my creatures. Now if it's a Chandra, then you're going to be tapped out and Chandra's going to be down to one, so then I can actually get rid of the Chandra with my token. So it does put Josh early in, in a tough spot because it's very unlikely that he kept in any number of hus uh, Harness lightning. Yeah, this is the thing. Raid. All that spot removal's been taken out. And the other thing about the three the attackers, they don't need to connect. They just need to attack. So right. Utter Layton's in the unenviable posi position of needing to remove a one a, like a one one token here to prevent it from attacking. And it showcases the power of Legion's landing. To begin with, puts a body on the battlefield. Wow. Secondly, applies a weird amount like this weird texture to a game in the sense that, you know, uh, if you can attack with three creatures, and then ramps you. This is the other side to it as well. He's got an, he's gonna have an extra mana here. So Josh Utter Layton Missing his third land drop after kind of the ideal start with a tune in Servant. And um, just kept mana up here. So kind of alarm bells need to be sounding in Yuki's head. It's like, what do you have here? Like, what can you possibly have? And if you take a look at Josh's hand. He does have a negate for wow, one of he's the payoff enchantments. But he's really respecting the anointed procession here. Yeah. So an attack from Matsumoto means that we do have the down to the four, first fort being established on the shores of Ixalan here. Matsumoto having a good old think about how he wants to progress through this turn after having gained an extra mana from a Danto. And this is what I was talking about in the way that it bridges the game towards the late game. You know, it's even if it's not generating tokens for Matsumoto here, the extra mana is still really important. Oh, and Josh Arlene here is b before the end step because the hidden stockpile triggers on the end step. He's going to go ahead and look to cast Appetite for the Unnatural mm -hmm. on the hidden stockpile. So this is still in Matsumoto's main phase, which means right. that he doesn't get the servo token. Now he plays another but one. He plays <laughs> <laughs> the second one, easy I mean, game. Really heads up play by Yuki. Yeah. He's, he was playing around Negate, and if Josh Arlene had the appetite for the natural, he's, you know, kind of wants to play before the end of turn trigger because mm. he doesn't want to give that token. So, yeah, that was a super heads up play by Yuki. And he still gets the same result. I mean, right. it, it forced other Layton to sort of, you know, take a turn off to play that uh, appetite. I mean, he's missing his land drops. He's under a bit of pressure here, the Hall of Famer. And Matsumoto's in a good spot to continue further here. I have to see something committed to the board. Another serve. And I can see a land in utter Layton's hand here. Yeah, yes, Josh just really, really wants to develop his mana here as he did miss that um, miss this third land drop. But... His hand is pretty loaded. He does have a World of Virtuoso, Chandra, Scarab God, and Negate. If he draws a mana source, he can. He has a ton of options. He can play the World of Virtuoso with Negate up. Although this is this is kind of where the window is open. Yeah. This is where Yuki, if he has a card like the Anointed Procession, this is the turn that he wants to resolve it. And we're going to see him dig for it here with Scry from Hidden Stockpile. And I this think this is, is on upkeep. On upkeep, too. yes, indeed. So that triggers the revolt and fumigate the draw here for. Matsumoto. I actually don't think Fumigate is horrible here. Josh Arlene missed his third land drop. Oh, yeah. He just hit his third land. And now the Fumigate will get the two uh, Servant of the Conduits off the board. Well, instead he's opting to cast Duress and a couple of Ooh. options here in uh, Chandra and Negate, but it's going to be the Chandra. Okay. But you just, you just snap off the Fumigate there? I don't know if I snap it off, but I would be very tempted to do so because you kind of... You're 
slowing down Josh's game plan, you know his hand is likely just full of a lot of very powerful effects. And his hand could easily just have like a glory bringer or a scarab god, mm -hmm. in which case the duress just wouldn't have done a whole lot. Um, kind of doing what Yuki did allows him to play a duress and still make a token off the Adanto. But, um, but still constricting uh, Adelaiden's mana there with the Fumigate and then having a, a servo uh, enter the battlefield thanks to Hidden Stockpile. That may have been uh, you know, another line here for Matsumoto. Yeah, and the coast was clear. The coast was clear to, to resolve the Fumigate. And Adelaide not looking to commit to that Scarab God, obviously wanting to keep Negate up, but Adanto doesn't mind about the Negate. In comes a Vampire. Yeah, but these tokens... Right to the uh, bottom. Not going to be able to attack for a while. Uh, Josh Hurley is just motley crew of two mana 2-2s two and three mana 2-3s are going to do a good enough job keeping these creatures off the board. And he's in a good spot with this Negate. I think Negate is really uh, keeping things uh, nice and tight here for Adelaide. Because, uh, again, yeah, it just hits everything. It hits everything that Matsumoto wants to do. Yeah. I also think it, it would have been possible to, like, maybe consider saving the duress until you kind of drew an anointed procession to just make sure you can kind of resolve that when you can. Now Josh Erlene's probably going to negate this. Fumigate. Put I guess he could stack. be, he, if he's super respectful of the um, anointed procession, maybe he'll just let this resolve. But... We're going to negate it. Yeah, Get that like, out of here. Says I'm going to use my two mana spell to counter your five mana spell. It seems pretty good. Pretty good. Rate. Seems like a pretty good race. <laughs> so Adelaide now with the opportunity to untap with uh, Matsumoto not having too much to say about this. And uh, Adelaide slowly but surely drawing ahead here. And I have to say, Matsumoto hasn't had the draw that he's looking for here. Yeah, well, he, he didn't play the procession. It's kind of weird with this deck. It's like the hidden stockpile does slowly get you to the procession because you can scry mm -hmm. every single turn. But this... Uh, Team or energy deck, every single turn just puts so much pressure on the board. So Matsumoto, an important draw. <laughs> he just <laughs> remembered the scry. Just All remembered right. it. Didn't look at that card, of course. And it's cast out in his hand here. And that's a crucial card for him to have drawn. But oh, anointed no, no. It's procession. An anointed, anointed procession. Anointed procession in, in hand as well here. So wow, that's a, what a draw. Yeah, now, so look. We've got a game in our hands, Paul, because we've got both players with marquee cards down. We've got World of Virtuoso up against, alongside the Scarab God, up against Hidden Stockpile and Anointed Procession. So right now, these players are both hitting their straps. They're doing exactly what they want to do. Yeah, it's really interesting that, that Josh Ederleyton did not choose to make at least one Thopter here end of turn because it is kind of a way for him to get in some points of damage. Um, I don't know what he was looking to do with the energy because it looks like he has six energy. Now, interestingly, the Scarab God is not in a position, I think, to bring anything back at all. I think we've got creatureless graveyards. Is that right, Paul? Yeah, well, the Anointed Procession deck plays zero creatures, so... And I don't think Josh Erlina has any either. So the currently, just, just a, a five, measly... Five, five. Five, yeah, just a measly 5-5 five, five that never dies. An attack here from Adelaide, and it's going to put some pressure on Matsumoto, who, as you mentioned, is not playing very many creatures at all, just the uh, Anointed Priests in the main, and then cards like Hostage Taker and Scarab God in the board. Sometimes we see Angel of Sanctions. Oh, wow, another big draw. What's this? These are huge draws out of Yuki. He found an Anointed Procession, and now he drew a cast out. And it looks like Hostage Taker as well. In hand for Matsumoto. Wow. So that's going to take care of the Scarab God and an attack for four. Look at that. Come and get some, he says. Adelaide, however, is going to bring a Thopter into bear, taking care of that lifelink vampire. Now, Josh Adelaide has a lot of great draw still, though. He does have the Appetite for the Unnatural, which he could use to get his Scarab God back. And he has, of course, Vraska which is kind of the ideal card that he wants in this situation. Playing the card very close to his chest here, the Hall of Fame. He didn't get a great look at it, at what it was. Double block from Matsumoto on this servant. These players seem to be racing here. Well, jo Josh can't really afford to sit back here because Yuki is netting a token every single turn with the interaction of Hidden Stockpile and the Anointed Procession. Long Tusk Cub enters the fray as well. Adelaide not with great energy reserve, only four. Ooh, no upkeep No upkeep time. scry for Matsumoto. He just knew. Just yeah, knew. Well, sometimes you just have a good feeling. Knew the top card of his library was going to be fantastic. Let's have a look at what it is. Double hostage wow. taker. Wow. Does he have an island in play? It's hard, it's hard to tell. Does he have a way to to, uh, to cast these? I mean, there is a lot of... He obviously okay. does. A lot of fixing <laughs> uh, in this, uh, the token stick between Renegade map and cards like uh, Evolving Wilds. Yeah, and he can even play the cub here if you want. He can play the cub, and he's going to do it. There we oh, go. Oh, wow. Hostage has been taken. What a big turnaround here. 
And Matsumoto slowly but surely crawling his way ahead. Now, Adelaide Layton, he's got to draw something special here, Paul. Oh, he needs a Vraska. Once again, playing it very close to his chest, <laughs> not giving team coverage a good look at what's going on in the hand of, uh, of Adelaide here. Matsumoto sitting pretty. I think an appetite would also be a pretty good draw here to be able to kind of ambush the ground creatures at, at Is it a Vraska? Speed. We've got six mana. Oh, it's six mana. Is it Vraska? No. It may be another Planeswalker, It's the however. other Planeswalker, which doesn't do quite as much. <laughs> Adelaide is like, oh, gee, should have really like, just should have brought I really wish Vraska. this was just Vraska's number three and four. Yeah, yeah. So here is uh, Nissa, the Steward of Elements, going to scry two oh, here for Adelaide. Bottom. And double bottom. Oh, oh no. no. Oh, no. So five loyalty on the Steward here. Planes off the top for Matsumoto. We know the other card in his hand. Hostage Taker. We're going to take another hostage here, Matsumoto. What's he going to do? Yeah, it's, it's pretty likely here. I'd be just just take the World of Virtuoso and mm -hmm. cast it off the land that you have. And yep. kind of put Josh to the test. Do you want to use that last piece of energy to make a Thopter, which he probably will, given how behind he is on board currently. Shooting from the hip pole, Cheon recognizes exactly what's up here. And this should be on six energy. Oh, he played it for three. Okay, okay. He played a tap land. No, he only had it. He only he had it was the only card in his in his hand. He didn't play a land that turn, so he just overpaid. I don't know. I thought he paid. A f I thought he spent four mana to. He tapped six mana. He tapped six mana. Right? He tapped six mana okay. and put into play with three load of counters. I mean, unless there's a, a, an invisible uh, Thalia somewhere, then then we've missed something here. That's unusual. Right. That's unusual. <laughs> Although I don't think Yuki especially cares about no, the No, he, <laughs> he's not going to be contesting it. And once again, Matsumoto <laughs> uh, <laughs> mixing up which ones do and don't have vigilance hits the second time that's happened for him. Obviously, he can smell blood in the water. Bit of a bit of a feeding frenzy for him now as he's looking to add the scalp of the newly minted Hall of Famer, Josh Adelaide, to his belt. He's got to draw up some tricky blocks here. Matsumoto has taken hostages. He's got his engine online. You can see there in the bottom right-hand corner of the play area. Not Hidden a lot of... pile and anointed procession. Yeah, and taking that World of Virtuoso were so huge. Yuki actually has the mana to pump that Long Tusk Cub, which makes the blocks even more difficult for Josh Adelaide. Normally, you'd just be like, okay, I'll put my Servant of the Conduit there and we'll just trade, because you're not playing an energy deck. But, but no. Double hostage taker. Yeah, <laughs> double hostage taker means that Matsumoto's <laughs> got a bit of energy going on here. So he can pump up that cub to a 3-3. Won't be small forever. Of course, the biological improbability of this animal has not affected its playability in standard, ladies and gentlemen. I really like that little innovation, just adding blue because you have access to such good maps yeah. already with yeah. the Evolving Wilds and the Renegade, Renegade map. Renegade map. Playing the Hostage Taker, just allowing you to just, you know, steal Teamer's best creatures because oftentimes they won't have the removal. Well, we've seen players like BBD experiment with things oh. like... Uh, we're going to tune with Ether. That's going to tune with Ether. We've seen him experiment with uh, with things, you know, with, with the blue, uh, like an Esper list of the, this token, uh, this token strategy, and it hasn't really taken off. But I like the combination here. Right. So back to Matsumoto, who's got look at this, so many permanents. Talk about going wide. He's having a great time. <laughs> having a great time, and and you know he's he's just that far ahead that it's going to be, you know, it's like it's a snowball deck. Right. The further it gets ahead, the harder it is for the opponent to come back. And oh, now we're going to see the team. Big attack here. Adelaide with two blockers. There's not much <laughs> he can do. Yeah. I, I mean, he blocks the two biggest creatures, and then that's 3, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 16 damage. Enough is enough yep. for Adelaide. And unfortunately for him, his first loss of the tournament down to 3 and 1. But Yuki Matsumoto, the man on your screen, beside himself with joy after a very, very convincing Game 3 win. He took out Game number 1 in style, going down in Game number 2 to the Hall of Famer, but Game number 3 falling his way. And he's got to be very, very happy with that performance, Paul Cheon. As we welcome you back to the booth, ladies and gentlemen, Riley Knight alongside Paul Cheon. What a pleasure it's been to have your company for the first round of Standard here at Pro Tour Ixaline. But of course, plenty more coming your way before very much longer. Stick around. Don't go anywhere because we'll be back live from Albuquerque in just a few moments. We'll see you back here very soon.
So time has been called here in round four, the first of five standard rounds here at Pro Tour Ixalan. So everyone now has unveiled their 60 cards, plus their 15 card sideboard, of course, ready to battle. Well, this round we're gonna focus a little bit on Team Channel Fireball. Uh, they came in, they went an astonishing 16 and two in draft, four three and O's, two two and ones. How did they fare once they went into constructed? Well, Mike Sigrist and Ben Stark, who were the two and ones from draft, they both won this round. Uh, Sigrist over Brandon Montoya and Ben Stark in an all Hall of Fame clash, he defeated Japan's Shuhei Nakamura. They've been teammates in the past before, um, of course. So they're both at three and one now, Sigrist and Stark. Uh, and then the four three and O's, how did they do? Well, Josh Adelayton, we've just seen lose to Yuki Matsumoto, of course, three owed his draft. Uh, Luis Scott Vargas uh, loses his perfect record. He's three and one, and that's because Yan Wing Chung, the semi-finalist uh, from the last Pro Tour, Hour of Devastation, he defeated LSV. Anthony Lee defeated Martin Yuza, so Yuza remains on his three wins. He has his first loss. But Paolo Vita Dama de Rosa, who was in the feature match area, he still has a perfect record. So as things stand, 4-0 for Paolo, 3-1 for all the rest of Team Channel Fireball. A fantastic start to their Pro Tour weekend. But we like to keep things minty fresh here on the show, and that means heading down to the floor where Brian David Marshall is with a very successful team indeed. Thanks, Rich. I'm here with Team MTG Mint Card, and the captain is Lee Shi Tian. Uh, Lee, tell me about uh, your preparation process for this Pro Tour. Uh, you guys hold up with two teams once again. Yeah, we test with um, Connected Company, which is which included like some MTG Bank Card members, like in, in the last year, and then we yeah we test uh, limited over uh, online, and then we pay. Um, GP, the limited GP the week before, like in all the regions. Now, your team for MTG Mint Card is largely unchanged, but there's one new addition going on over here. What's happening with the, the new team member? Well, he make go this year. Last year, we have uh, our, our goal is to qualify Lam Song Wu, who didn't have any level. And yeah, after last year, he's he still don't have any level, and we think we might have uh all go pass players in in the team so and yam just make topic in in last photo and then he make go so we, we included him in the team so but let's let's talk to yam it's the first time we get to hear you from since the last pro tour which was a tremendous result for you that perhaps you know ended with a loss but you're off to a pretty good start here tell me about your last round uh, here in this tournament uh yeah so uh last round uh i just play against uh, rsv and yeah, and I got lucky and I draw like, you know, the card that I'm playing and I would uh, win like a really cl close game in a match. The, the card that you're playing? Uh, yeah, I guess everyone knows I'm playing Hazard now. <laughs> <laughs> okay, and you got to attack with it and uh, it was it was good? Uh, yeah, I only have one card when I draw it. So as, as soon as I cast it, I have one card I can attack. All right, well, congratulations on getting off to a great start here. How's MTG Mint card doing overall? Oh, we got two players having 4-0 and then 1-3-1 one, one, and then 1-2-2-2 two, 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 and 1-1-3. One, one, so I think it's above average. Yeah, we have yeah, at least more win than lost now. All right, so that's what's going on here with Team MTG Mint Card Hazard attacking into the red zone. Thanks very much to uh, BDM. Uh, thanks so much to Hazaret, the fervent. Um, now, with over 400 players, we can't keep track of everyone for you. So here's the first time, as far as I'm aware, that we've had the chance to mention Owen Turtonwell to you. Obviously a fantastic player um, and part of the Peach Garden Oath um, and also a part of one of the great teams this time around. So Owen is 4-0. Uh, so is Paul Rietzel uh, at 4-0. Now, Guillaume Matignon, uh, he, if you... Uh, are a student of the game. You'll probably remember him from the mid-2000s, 2010, 2011. He played in that famous playoff against Brad Nelson for Player of the Year. Guillaume Matignon has opened up 4-0. and oh. And a terrific match that happened off camera. Andre Strasky uh, advances to 4-0 and oh at the expense of Reed Duke, of course, teammate um, of Owen Turtonwald and indeed Paul Rietzel. Andrew Cuneo is also on that team, uh, and he was just beaten by Philip Braverman, who maybe you don't know much about. You're about to know a little bit more, because he has a super sweet deck for us. It's time for the first deck tech of Pro Tour Excellence. 